Good day or good night, everybody who has joined us for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation going outside the standard of care, when, why, and how this should inform better systems and policies. I'm Lisa Maurice, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar. Can we have the next slide, please, Isabella? Our objectives for today's event are to discuss how systems can set clinicians up for failure. We want to examine the drivers and impact of stepping outside the standard of care. We want to apply the just culture framework to evaluate decision making for systems improvement and describe the data that can identify system failures before harm occurs. Next slide. We are offering CE, continuing education credit for nurses, physicians, and pharmacists. Participants will receive an automatic, automated evaluation from MedStar via email within five to seven days. Next slide. This is what the email from MedStar will look like if you would like to receive continuing education credit for the physicians, nurses, or pharmacists. Next slide. We are also offering continuing education for healthcare executives, certified professionals in patient safety, board certified patient advocates, and certified professionals in healthcare quality. Next slide. As you can see, the panelists, including myself, do not have any conflicts of interest to report. Now I'd like to introduce everybody to you. As I said, my name is Lisa Maurice. I'm the Executive Director of Consumers Advancing Patient Safety, and I am a patient advocate for the past 25 plus years. I'm very excited today to welcome our panelists and they include Robin Betts, who has been the Vice President for Safety, Quality, and Regulatory Services at Kaiser Permanente. Robin helps further advance Kaiser Permanente's excellence in quality and patient safety and oversees health plan and hospital regulatory functions, including compliance, licensing, and member grievances. Kaiser's Northern California, California region provides services that are integrated to uh, 4 million members with 4,500 physicians and 21 medical centers and numerous medical officers. I noted in her LinkedIn that one of her students had said, if one has a chance to learn from her, don't miss it. So we're glad to have Robin with us today. Laura Herrero joins us from Spain today. Laura is a PhD candidate and holds a degree in telecommunications engineering and is an instructor in me medical simulation by the Institute for Medical Simulation in Boston. She works at the innovation department of I I Edeval since 2010 as an innovation manager and since 2014 also as a human factors engineer in the research group EvalTech. She's led several projects related to human factors engineering and patient safety related to the design and use of healthcare technologies and processes for healthcare providers and companies. Laura has done fellowships in the United States and Canada in different reference centers for the use of human factors in healthcare. And we're excited to have you join us today, Laura. And final, finally, Nico Koptin currently focuses on after incident investigations and strategic consulting in safety and security. He is the executive director of Maruda, an associate of the COT Institute for Safety, Security and Crisis Management and an affiliated teacher at Northumbria University. He was head of research and consultancy at COT from 2012 until the end of 2018. His areas of expertise are safety and security strategy, 
post-incident review, analysis, and crisis management. His current focus is on just culture assessment, training, implementation, and evaluation. Before 2012 at Capgemini, he was Global Operations Director of Public Security, and at TNO Defense Research, he was responsible for scientific research, consultancy, and project management in defense and road safety. He's joining us from the Netherlands, and we're very excited to have Nico with us today. All right, as we get into this topic, the first thing we really want to do is define what do we mean by the standard of care? Robin? Well, thank you, Lisa. You know, we, we hear the term standard of care, it's often, it's often kind of association with a legal term as it relates to medical malpractice. We use it uh, in, in hospitals and, and healthcare delivery to look at um, how we review the practice of, of medicine. Did it meet the standard of care? We often have peers, uh, a peer provider review practice when it's in question to see if it meets uh, accepted guidelines. Uh, from a medicine perspective, the standard of care is the medical or psychological treatment guideline and can be general or very specific. It specifies appropriate treatment based on uh, scientific evidence and collaboration between both medical and scientific evidence in, in collaboration between medical and psychological professionals in, in the treatment of a given condition. However, there are many other standards that uh, we include in a grouping called generally accepted practice standards that define how we practice as nurses, respiratory therapists, all of us, how practice should be carried out and generally supported um, by evidence-based um, guidelines. Not always, but, but when we often use peers in those, uh, in those specialties, to um, help us understand if this is how one performer would do the job over another and identify opportunities for improvement. Um, Nico, you might be able to add some insights into the, this term or this definition around standard of care. Yes, maybe so. I will try. Thanks, Robin. Um, so, um, of course, the standard of care, as you described, is like key yeah, since it captures everything we've learned scientifically on how best to treat our patients and how um, how to do that in a, in a very safe manner. Yeah. The only thing is that in addition to that, we so, we've also like learned how complex our healthcare system has become, which means that there is apart from just the standard of care uh, in the way we treat like illnesses or patients, we also need like other principles and standards in addition to this standard of care to make sure we develop a, a safe environment for our practitioners and, and patients, as we will, uh, I think, further explore in the conversations we'll, we'll be having today. So nothing against the basic knowledge and understanding as developed in our standards of care, but we will need a bit extra next to that. A, a little bit extra is always helpful as we explore this. And Laura, with that in mind, what does it mean when we say design systems in a way to make it easy to do the right thing? I'd like first to introduce what, because I'm here as a human factors engineer, and I don't know if the audience is familiar with that term. So human factors is a, it's a, science, a science, a frame of knowledge that applies what we know about human, human strengths and limitations, both cognitive and, and physical. And we design, we try to design systems that address those, those needs. Uh, and what is a system, especially in, in healthcare, we have into account all the relations between, so we understand healthcare as a system in which the, the person is at the center, person understanding patient or, or clinicians, uh, but there are a lot of, of um, interactions among persons, um, tasks, processes, technologies, and we need to understand what, what that system looks like. And I wanted to talk about an example, maybe to, to 
illustrate what, what I want to, to say about how we can design systems so that they are safer. I don't know if Isabel, if you can show the image. So I work as a clinical human factors specialist at uh, Valdecilla, our hospital. So uh, we identified there was a, a, a problem related to urine dipsticks. What, what was this problem? Uh, some physicians uh, didn't started to not trusting this uh, completely easy to use and uh, elementary uh, device or technology. It's especially used, frequently used in, in pediatric and in pediatric emergency, emergency rooms. So when we jumped in the project, this is what we saw. Most of the people in the hospital thought this is, urine dipsticks are completely easy to use, but this is what we saw. Uh, if you see like, for example, the second, third or fourth row, how slight different uh, in colors there is to identify the result and identify if the baby has any type of problem. What we also identified is that in within the same emergency room, there were two different products, two different vendors providing these urine dipsticks. And this might not be a problem, but we saw that for example, the, the rows didn't match the, the elements that they were testing. So in the, the um, technology on the on the right, uh, the blood was in one position, but on the on the left was in a different position. The, having into account that physician uh, nurse aides who are responsible, at least in in Spain, for doing this, they do several uh, in, in a shift. Uh, they think that this is a very simple and might not be useful um, protocol to 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 use. So they are on on a um, they might not pay attention to, to the results. Uh, so what, what do we need? We need at least in this case, for example, to make sure that there's only one product. There are no different products coexisting. And also that this is easy to understand, which we identified that it wasn't. So this is like, it might sound a bit silly, but this is a clear example of how we can uh, help design systems so that we can help clinicians uh, do their work and get to do the the easiest thing, the the correct thing. Well, I, I really like that explanation. I appreciate you providing the the example of making it easier to do the correct thing. Something as simple as having two different vendors that can use two different standards, as it were, for how you evaluate the test result is pretty scary, actually, from a patient standpoint. Mm -hmm. What are the circumstances like this that set us up for failure in clinical care? Robin? You know, I think there's several factors that can set us up for failure. Um, one of them is, is developing for the clinical staff instead of with them, not including the right stakeholders in the process of developing um, a, a new process or a, a, a a redesign of something is a setup for failure. Those closest to the work can surface the best solutions for us. And then attempting to generalize a policy or procedure to, um, disparate, organ to disparate organizations uh, where it's difficult to operationalize. An example I can give you is often um, our hospital systems have uh, very large hospitals and then maybe you might have a few very small rural hospitals and you wanna have standardized policies and procedures and guidelines. So if you had a policy that in maternal child health that requires a nurse to only take one baby out of the nursery at a time to assure that you have appropriate identification and matching of mom to baby. And then that policy also states that no baby can be left unattended in the nursery. How does a nurse who's taking care of both the moms and babies operationalize that in a small rural hospital where maybe both moms needed a break, both babies were resting in the nursery, and now she needs to take one out. So we need to work with the staff to design it so we can be safe and compliant, um, but make sure that it's, they can actually operationalize the recommendations. I think also we don't always resource them to be successful. So if you have a new central line insertion bundle, you need to work with your supply chain to make sure that the insertion packets those sterile packets come 
ready with all the new supplies and equipment that they need to be successful. Um, for safe patient handling, uh, you want to make sure that you have available lift equipment that you want your nurses to do, um, and that it's easily accessible so that they will use it when ambulating, ambulating or transferring the patient. And then also think about, um, uh, did you design with the idea to make it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing? And this is what Laura was talking about, incorporating human factor science into that uh, design. Um, I know Laura might have other additions to this as well. Uh, yeah, I think I like this this quote by Lashin Lieb saying that um, professionals, 99% of professionals, it's not literal, but 99% of, of healthcare professionals are trying to do the, the best work and is the system uh, help not helping them to, to do it and um, making making mistakes. And we know from, from the evidence that if people don't like to to devi deviate like if there is a better way to do something and that better way is safer there wouldn't be any workarounds but healthcare is it's it's complex uh, it's very difficult to standardize and even uh, when when possible standardization is not always the the better option um yeah i think <laughs> Sorry, I, I, missed, I, I, I hear what, what you're saying. Say. So you're right. Standardization isn't always the better option, and I think that gets to Robin's example of the larger facility versus the facility in a small community where the rules may need to be a little bit different. So that standardization is one example. Nico, do you have some examples? Yeah, and and um, it's also a fairly generic point. Have we? We've learned, we have a tendency as human beings to when, when something goes wrong, when we are uncertain about a certain outcome, we just invent new rules or new procedures to make it, so to say, safer. But in reality, we, we make it more complex. There's a couple of publications where people have counted the amount of rules we have to comply with as a practitioner, and it's even impossible to read them all. And so we overdo it in a way. There is way too many rules and they don't always make sense. They're not like often enough evaluated and revisited. Um, and, and you're right, Laura and Robin mentioned it as well. The, the, the complexity of the system is not like, it doesn't work to approach a complex system with just rules and procedures. And we have to allow professionals to do their job, what they have been trained to do. And um, so it, it, the like um, the overwhelming amount of rules is an element of the system that sets it up for failure because sometimes it's safer not to comply because those who invented the rules couldn't like imagine all possible situations that like professionals may come, come across. So we need to find a balance between what we call um, like work as imagined and the rules um, the, the way we, we think a, a process or a task should be done and like work has done, the reality. Uh, you can't predict all possible situations. So you have to find a balance and to like make a helpful procedure, a, a standard, anything that helps us summarize what we have learned as a safe practice, but also we need to, to allow for flexibility and uh, 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 professionals to improvise and we generally don't do that enough. I, I really mm -hmm. like that Nico because I, what you're talking about in terms of flexibility is maybe instead of setting things in in what we use the the term setting things in stone um, maybe instead of that we need to have a range of options for how processes and procedures are done. I, I can see, Laura, that you had something else to say. Yeah, what, what Nika said made me think about another example for that uh, even when we can standardize process in, in healthcare, most of, most of the standardization goes into um, diagnosis and treatment. 
for example, especially in, clinic, in clinical practices. And there are many other things that are not taken into account in, in these cases. And we had, for example, a project in which uh, we studied uh, how uh, a team uh, reacted to the massive hemorrhage and everything was great everything like all the diagnosis and treatment elements were very good uh, uh, shown in a, in a protocol and it was easy to follow that protocol but there were many other things that didn't went uh, in that protocol such as what information does a nurse need to exchange with uh, uh, lab test to send uh, a blood sample to the blood bank, for example, to get uh, to get the new bags, or where was the medication? Was some some of the drugs were located in one room, others were located in a different room, and there was there were no signs and there was no information. So everyone had the information on what they need to do. Uh, responding to the emergency, but there were many, many other things that no one had thought about or no one had explained. Like, what information do I need to, to share with another physician when talking on the phone? Uh, where do I get this drug? What blood tests need to be, uh, or what sample needs to be taken from the patient? So those are really good examples, Laura. I like that you brought in a uh, uh, an example that really may be a high stress example of something that is emergent in nature and needs to be taken care of immediately. And there's a step-by-step -step protocol, but these other factors have not been included in that protocol and, and need to be examined. So going back though, to the concept that Nico was discussing of flexibility, how does deviation relate to the standard of care and how do leaders and professionals normalize deviation or flexibility? How can we navigate accountability in those situations? Robin? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that. Before I answer that, I just wanna give a great example for those who aren't familiar with human factor science. Um, a great example is seat belts. Uh, we, we, our seat belts are like right there. We just slide them out. Now, back in the day, you know, you had to dig them out from your seats. They, they didn't retract. Some people cut them off because they were in the way. Um, and in healthcare, we would have, it was very um, not common, but one of the, the serious safety events that was common in healthcare were tubing misconnections where a tube feeding would be infused into um, an IV tube, to, uh, an IV uh, infusion that would be going into your, circula your circulatory system. And a few years ago, finally, the industry responded by changing the male and female connectors so that tubing misconnections are impossible. I mean, you'd have to jimmy rig it to make it happen. So that's making it hard to do the wrong thing. And when you have a lot of lines, a lot of IV lines and things that you're managing as a nurse and having to trace those lines to make sure that everything's connected correct, correctly, it is hard to get it right. So making it hard to do the wrong thing has really reduced the incidence of tubing misconnection failure. Um, so I just wanted to just reflect on that. Um, as far as normalized deviation, normalization of deviance was brought to light by uh, Diane Vaughn, who reviewed the, the, the Challenger disaster. And Vaughn described this phenomenon as occurring when people within an organization become so insensitive to deviant practice that it no longer feels wrong. It's just how we do things in our department. We are very casual about a time out because the chance is really slim that we're going to have a wrong site surgery. Of course, we've marked it. We did a consent. However, failures do happen when we get casual about these standards. We, um, norm when we normalize deviance, we do not address the root causes of why we fail and design the process um, that supports compliance with, with um, processes that are proven to meet that and evidence-based and result in safe and quality outcomes. The impact of stepping outside of the standard of care is failure and the severity of harm can be varied, but we want to avoid harm at all costs. The other uh, variability is outcome. If you have an evidence-based standard of care, 
if strictly adopted, every patient and family member has equal opportunity for the same quality outcome and experience, this is compromised when you have uh, just accepted deviance in your department. Leaders and professionals normalize deviation when they actually support and reinforce that behavior. Um, Lisa, you actually shared an example when we were first coming together as a group to just talk about this topic. And I think this would be a good time for you to share uh, what that normalized deviation looked like. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say that later, but I'll, I'll bring it up now that um, I was a, uh, on a patient and family advisory council, as was a colleague of mine on the patient and family advisory council, we were in a different hospital than the one that we advised, but we had gone through the hospital systems uh, compliance training, and we were aware of many of the protocols that were required to uh, be done. And specifically in this case, when a nurse was checking medication out of the locked box at the nurse's station, um, two nurses had to be there to sign off on that the medication was accurate. And in this case, one nurse went to another nurse clear across the room to borrow her uh, employment badge and carry the badge not the nurse, just the badge over to swipe into the computerized lockbox system so that she could open the lockbox and get the medication out. So a system that was designed to have two people there actually only had one and a badge. So my colleague and I brought that up to the nurses that they weren't supposed to be doing that. And they were a little surprised that patients would be aware of the protocols that had been put in place. And, you know, as we, as we look at that, you could think that maybe reporting those nurses would be the right thing to do. But Nico, I think you have some perspectives on how you would apply a just culture framework in that situation. Uh yeah, definitely, because um, I have seen cases where, um, like a nurse failed to have a colleague double checked, uh, and double check the medication before applying it as it is supposed to happen. And if in those cases we would have like approached the situation as it seems fairly clear cut, because it's a very simple instruction, it's not adhered to, people deviate from the procedure. so. What else to look for? As you could say, let's simply um, warn or sanction the nurse involved and that's it. The only thing is if you do that, um, you fail to look for a potential like other factor that came into play, like in a specific example I have in mind, um, it was like a home care situation where there was a system that was supposed to help the nurses to have this like second set of eyes on the situation, but it didn't work well. It wasn't really doable. And if we would have simply punished that nurse and wouldn't have asked for like, why did it make sense for you had to do it this way? And why didn't you simply follow procedure? And if we would have failed to do that in a safe way, like welcoming people to share their accounts, had to like in a safe way, explain what happened before we already would have punished them, we would have stopped that source of information and failed to use the opportunity to make it safer. Um, and it doesn't mean uh, uh, to, to avoid a misunderstanding, it doesn't mean you need like a blame free culture, uh, because that's not the same. There is always time to look at someone's behavior a bit later in the process. But first we look at like what happened, who needs help, who is hurt, who is impacted by what happened, how can we perhaps restore some of that hurt and then later we try to understand so why and, and how more of the details of that situation and only later because we make sure we have stabilized that situation so that the same thing wouldn't happen again while we were looking into the situation and then mm -hmm. later there is ample time to find out whether we need to address the individual's behavior as well. So uh, when you're looking at this what are the um 
what is the framework of the just culture? What, what do we look at as we go through situations? Yeah, so, so the framework I'm working with, I'm uh, working with uh, Sidney Decker, some of you may uh, may have heard of him he's like uh, he's published on just culture and patient safety and also by the way uh, the the topic we addressed uh, uh, before hey, he calls it drifting to failure that's similar to the concept we discussed earlier but i work with him with like healthcare organizations in different countries and we basically um, apply the approach he's advocated in his book and that starts with like um find out who is hurt, how they are impacted, um, what they need, how we can address those needs. Uh, and since we also at the same time stabilize everyone's safety, um, we have time, a little bit of time to look after the hurt and to restore rather than to add more hurt to the situation by focusing on retribution. Again, not no blame, but this is the order of our steps. And then later, when we know a little bit more, we have like developed also with uh, uh, Mercy Care in the UK, healthcare organization. We've developed like a process as a gateway to, to an answer a number of check questions before we would go like after someone's individual uh, choices and behavior. And that would, for instance, address whether all on the same team would do the same thing in the same situation, because then it wouldn't make sense to just focus on that individual or whether the manager was aware of the practice, hasn't said anything about it had let it happen for like a couple of months and then the manager of course could be asked a couple of questions first before he would address like the team member um is the rule applicable did it make sense and so a couple of those questions and if there is all yeses there is ample time to like find uh, if it's really someone's individual behavior uh, consciously not following a rule where it did make sense to to do follow that rule, there is always time to like design and, and find for a proper sanction. I can see in the chat that this example has really resonated with the participants in this webinar. And uh, Kelly Wood said, we call that a cash register workaround referring to the badging issue. And uh, Jeannie Skibiski said, badging rules are as described are often seen as inefficient by frontline workers. And Irene Young has posted a just culture assessment tool measuring perceptions um, healthcare, uh, of healthcare professionals. So you might want to check the chat and feel free to chat in your question as well or your comments around what we are, are talking about. You know, Nico, uh, People who practice psych psychological safety encourage risk taking and innovation. Um, that's not really the same as breaking rules, but how do you apply a just culture framework? Yeah, just to, to be clear on what is meant with psych psychological safety and risk taking, hey, it's like Amy Edmondson's work that's, that's referred to here, and it's about interpersonal risk taking. And so to be safe, to ask a question, to make a comment, to uh, share an appreciation of a risk. And so that's the type of risk taking we want to develop. Of course, we don't want to like just take risks with our work or patients uh, without any further purpose, but to, to make people feel safe, to talk about safety, about risks, about things that didn't go as expected as planned. That's really uh, supporting a safe culture. Absolutely. And Robin, you have a comment. Yeah, I, I think when you have an idea, it's great to share and capture the idea of our team members, um, especially if it's something that could improve a process or a system. But in that innovation, um, in designing it, there need to be some controls and measurement to assure that we get the consistent outcome that we want. So really making sure that you're not just um, testing on your own and, and trying, trying things without having vetted it with um, a stakeholder group, that's also going to measure and monitor for any ramifications of that change, that test of change. So I think making sure you do that in a con controlled environment. Um, I just wanted to add to Lisa on the, um, someone asked if there are resources and there was that link provided. And, 
and there are um, quite quite a few resources around when something happens, an event happens to um, uh, to to use an algorithm to help determine um, the actions and motivations of an individual, and if um, another caregiver with similar skills and knowledge would react or act in the same way in a similar circumstance. And then through that process, we call that the substitution test, we say, mm, you know, so everyone in this department might be doing that. And that's one of the ways to identify normalized deviation and to begin the course correction. In um, my, my learnings from Nico, I really like the holistic approach that they have to the just culture because they they, you know, on the initiation of identifying an event, they look for immediate remediation opportunities that are very supportive to the team while they're trying to understand um, the deviation that happened. And I just really appreciate that and look forward to learning more from him about that too in, in my own personal future. <laughs> That is absolutely true. And you know, um, that that normalizing of, of issues relates back to the human factors uh, study, doesn't it, Laura? Mm -hmm. Yeah, here, it might be a language barrier. But to me, deviation sounds like that people are uh, consciously doing things wrong or willingly. And I don't know, I think we should try to understand why deviations are happening and maybe using human factors and system think systems thinking methods to understand why those I like to say workarounds <laughs> instead of deviations uh, why those those workarounds are happening and especially studying and listening to all the elements of the on the system. And in, in this case, I understand that there is a there is a workaround uh, in place. But but why is this nurse doing doing that? Why did she felt that that option taking someone else's badge was the right thing to do in that moment? And maybe uh, after and I like the, the the just culture framework and maybe combining it with uh, human factors um methods or system systems thinking first we would go into understanding what should have happened and what did happen that day and also relating to what robin just uh, just said what happened what happened that day is is usual it happens more often and in those cases we substitute interviews and and questionings for observing ethnographic research going right there on a regular day to day like what a, a normal uh, day should look like but what happened that day or what what is a more hectic or more relaxing day what what are the different variables um, in in this case maybe uh, nurses have too many patients to care for and while one nurse is taking care of a patient and needs to do something important, taking temperature, medication, whatever. The other cannot wait for the, the first nurse to go in and share the badge and double check and that. So we might need to think about what the, the policy or the, yeah, the policy is, is making them. Is that uh, doable? Absolutely. I think, I think you're on to something there that you need to look at a, a number of factors that go into that decision making process. One thing that I would ask, simple enough, is if the nurses understood the reasoning behind using two badges and if they thought it was just uh, a throwaway procedure, if they understood the severity of medication error and the frequency with which medication error occur occurs and what that means for the entire system. Um, I think that um, Una uh, McFadden had a great comment, and of course I would think this as a patient advocate, but I, she said, I think many patients or carers have good ideas for solutions for safer care, but are reticent or reluctant to speak up and organizations do not make them feel welcome to identify scope for an improvement. 
So I've seen several systems where uh, patient advocates do have input relative to how that could be a smoother process or a, even an easier process for the provider. And um, they may not be heard because they weren't asked in the first place. So that's, that's a, great, a great comment. We've had a couple of other really good comments in the chat, and we're going to try to get to some of those questions too. But first, I wanted to ask, what are different just culture frameworks? Do we have some different frameworks that we could talk about? Nico? Yeah, we, we do. And I guess some of the audience will be aware huh, that if you would like Google for just culture, there is like uh, two basic frameworks uh, uh, that you would find. And one is more like uh, a more uh, a retributive approach where there is like a clear algorithm uh, that would help you to, to decide about culpability. Uh, so depending on what, uh, whether it was like a simple mistake or uh, uh, some negligence or even uh, malicious intent had uh, that to make that distinction there is like a number of algorithms available um that is not the type of just culture i'm working with because the risk there is a couple of risks with that it's very difficult to make that this distinction often it, it's not really done independently and also there is always like the focus backwards on uh, uh, and and there is a risk if you focus on culpability too much and too soon you will like forget or pay less attention to understanding improvement and investing in safety. Um, and that is why the other approach that I summarized before, starting with finding about the, the hurt, the impact, restoring these uh, uh, these hurts, these impacts. Um, yeah, that's that's the David Marx. So that, that's one of the advocates of the other approach. Um, and of course, they aim the same outcome. Huh? They also aim to have like a safe system and a safe culture. So nothing wrong with intent, but I just believe the other approach works works better because then we have like uh, there is ample time later on if there needs to be a talk about culpability about that type of backwards looking accountability, we can we can go there. But before we get there, we can do so much to learn to restore uh, to have like a, a positive forward looking accountability outcome uh, without losing anything uh, from the from the other end. So these Retributive versus restorative just cultures is both what you would find in literature. Well, you know, I you, you used a word that that really resonates with me, and that was intent, because as we look at just culture, we often look at the intent, and usually people don't have any intention of doing harm. And yet their actions may lead to harm if they fail to follow certain protocols. Robin, what do you see as a framework for just culture in organizations you've worked with? I, I think that we have, um, in the organizations I've worked with, we've generally gone with the, uh, the earlier models of just culture, using the algorithm to help managers um, identify culpability. Um, you know, they look at the first step is that they analyze the individual caregivers' actions um, via five measures, such as impaired judgment, malicious action, reckless action, was it a risky action, or was this an unintentional error? Um, the second step was to determine, determine if the other caregivers and similar skills and knowledge would react the same way in a similar circumstance, and that's that substitution test. And then the final step is the you know, the important determination of whether the, the present system supports reckless or risky behaviors and thus needs to be redesigned. Um, but what I really like about uh, Nico's work is the, uh, the word he uses of restorative, to restore the confidence and the capabilities of the team, to uh, set the stage right up front that we just want to understand. Let's put in some remedial actions to make sure this doesn't happen again in our unit. So let's move quickly. And then uh, we just want to learn. And I just, um, I, I think it's really important that we don't jump to conclusions too quickly. And uh, the more mature framework that Nico and his team has been working on really 
facilitates that kind of restorative culture. I love that word. I think we really need it uh, in these times when, uh, especially when with COVID and all that has happened, uh, our, our staff and our clinicians have been really challenged and being as supportive as we can is important while at the same time holding them accountable, which, um, which the work that NICO presented does do. Um, so I really like that. I wondered, Lisa, if I could just share a great story of how patients uh, can inform a process uh, to improve. And uh, because we were talking about that just before this. Sure. Uh, let's do that quickly because we have a couple more questions to answer here. Go ahead. Oh, good. I just, yeah. So uh, it's been com common practice that many units, uh, departments, uh, pr have huddles every morning. And at one of my hospitals in the neonatal intensive care, they invite any parents or family members who are attending to join the huddle. During this huddle, they, it's just really a quick look back on the last 24 hours and a look ahead so we anticipate our challenges instead of react to them when they come up. During a huddle, you can raise safety concerns that speak up culture. And one nurse raised the concern that because the babies are in the units for so long, their ID uh, armbands start to wear off and, and the, the barcode and things like that, that that create them safety. So it was decided in the moment that they would at select a day of the week and they would just change all armbands. Well, a parent was there and said, you know, we're wearing our armbands too. And that's one of the safety identifiers when we come in the unit. Could you change parent armbands on the same day that you change the baby so that we make sure all the right people are coming in and who, who know the environment and know how to uh, behave safely in the environment. And, and they're the right people who are matched with the right babies. And just an example of, um, you know, how when we don't include um, that participant, that stakeholder, uh, we miss opportunities to elevate safety. So anyway, just wanted to share that quick story. Well, thanks so much for bringing the, the parents into it. And as a NICU parent myself of many months in NICUs with different children that I had, um, it's that's very important. And it would be interesting if more uh, facilities included uh, patients and family members in, in safety huddles. Um, you know, I, I really want to uh, address a couple of the questions that have been asked by our participants today. Um, a couple of people have mentioned that the staffing issues um, are one of the overwhelming reasons for nursing errors and creating an inadequate safe environment due to inadequate staffing, um, especially with COVID and the pressure that is on facilities. Um, earlier, another person had brought up uh, staff to patient ratios as a driving factor in uh, deviation from norm or variance. Uh, what do you all have to respond to that. Laura, have you looked at staffing ratios as you've looked at human factors? Yeah, especially now with COVID, but what can I say? I think that's a, that's a common problem, problem um, all over the world. And that leads, and I, I think that's a, also a, a sign and, and we see how good people and good professionals are trying to do their best uh, work with what they they are given, and I haven't got an answer because it's a it's a great issue here as well. Well, Robin, what do you see uh, in terms of that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know we need to be highly reliable organizations, and we need to be able to be resilient and and have consistent outcomes, no matter. So, what is our what is our system for onboarding new staff? What is our system when we have broad COVID exposures in our department and we have a lot of contingent nurses? How do we bring traveler nurses or uh, on-call nurses into our environment and how do we support them when we're there? Um, so there should be um, you know, leadership standards and practice standards, onboarding standards that support the capabilities and competencies of your team. Um, in 
you know, I, I have 21 hospitals. We have 4.4 million members. I really have not seen uh, staffing as uh, the core element to our, our safety event. Uh, I see more normalized deviation or just deviation work around. And I, I, when, we, when we do the deep dive and really look at the staffing, staffing actually was not a contributor. They were generally what we call rule-based errors where we knew what to do, but we chose not to do it. And uh, a lot of times it has to do with casualness around um, practice standards, doing a great timeout, doing really great um, consenting, um, is, is one uh, doing the nurse double check? So um, I, I, I I'm not even, seeing that trend. Don't even right now with COVID have have you ha haven't you had any issues hiring hiring nurses? Uh, we we do. You know we have a I'm a very large organization, so we have a lot of resources to help uh, do our contracting with contingent nurses, and then we have a way to onboard them. So we do that in advance. We have a lot of predictive algorithms as we watch what's going on internationally and across our country to anticipate our surges. And then even normal, every, you know, we have surges with flu every year. And so we anticipate, and oftentimes travelers come back, so they are familiar with us. So uh, we have, I'm not saying that we never have, so, have never had challenges, but we know, work as a community with our community, um, other hospitals to, to help each other. This, this really is, is bringing up a kind of a visceral feeling for me because I've had uh, situations where uh, staffing has impacted my child's care. And I'll just give you one example. I had um, a child in the hospital for meningitis, my complex chronic ill child developed um, meningeal encephalopathy actually and uh, the hospital didn't recognize that the child was dehydrated initially and ended up having to do a cut down on the femoral vein in order to get an IV going and uh, placed my kiddo on a floor where the staffing ratio was seven to one and the person who was staffing my child was a licensed practical nurse instead of a registered nurse and could not change a dressing on a femoral line. The uh, femoral line, of course, is in an area that's particularly risky for a child who has not yet become toilet uh, independent. And uh, we had stool on the dressing. And I tried for literally 12 hours to get that dressing changed. And it uh, did not get changed, which of course uh, poses an extreme infection risk for my child um, because the uh, nurse that was taking care of my child had so many other patients and the only person who could have changed it was the charge nurse and he didn't have time to get the charge nurse or the charge nurse ignored his pleas for help. I was able to elevate my concerns eventually and get my needs met, but I think there are issues where staffing makes a, a huge, uh, plays a huge role, um, particularly when there are certain uh, procedures or protocols that um, some members of staff need other members of staff to do for them. Um, and uh, it just, as a, as, a, as a caregiver, that becomes an extremely frightening situation when care isn't being, being given. So I, I think that uh, that is an interesting uh, situation. Uh, Emily Halu says, perceptions of short staffing, time pressure, and not being flexible or not critical thinking causes more errors than true short staffing, physically not having enough bodies or hands in my experience as well. And that's a, that's a good observation, Emily. Nico, uh, what I, would you say? Yeah, oh, I was hoping to add a little bit to that hey, because as, as was apparent in the introduction, I'm involved in many like after incident investigations as they are often called and then of course the perception of uh, short staffing or, or real short staffing it's always at the table sometimes uh, we we may find there is like a, a link with what happened but but not always and 
but sometimes there are like related topics have for instance because there is less staff than planned things go differently than expected differently than uh, uh, agreed before and procedures cannot be carried out exactly how they were designed but it doesn't need to be a problem and so what i always look for is whether people are safe enough to really like speak up when it's not safe because of short staffing it's not just counting uh, counting the number of people it's simply how what is your practice because there can be like a, a one or two persons sick or absent for any reason and it doesn't need to become an unsafe practice just because of that but if it does there needs to be a safe system to talk about it and to find for solutions and also to make sure safety is not an unnecessarily compromised in the meantime and so sometimes people do feel that sh being short-staffed is the reason for things well going bad in a situation um, but it takes really a careful look to find out whether whether that is exactly what went wrong mm -hmm. having said that we have seen had to respond to laura in, in the netherlands in the uk in, in many countries i have seen uh, many cases of, of short staffing in the past two years mm -hmm. um, and uh, in in many cases we did find for safe solutions but especially in the beginning of of COVID, when uh, there were no tests there were no vaccines yet um, there was i guess a different standard in reality uh, because there was so much uh, uh, compromised safety in other ways already like following a procedure wasn't the main concern at the time and in in, in my experience when i uh, when we've done some research on on events uh, shortage of staff uh, is never on the table for the people reporting. I mean, they assume that's the way it should be. Like if I need to take care of 10 patients, that's my that's my job, everyone does. But even though it's unconscious, uh, that, might be, that might be a problem. And relating to the example uh, Lisa mentioned before, uh, uh, having many patients or different protocols might lead to a, a nurse, for example, in this case, uh, to do a workaround that if there were more nurses, mm -hmm. she wouldn't need to. And and also, have we have mm -hmm. like long waiting lists for some types of care, and mm -hmm. that's an unsafe uh, unsafe situation in a different way. So you, again, you better look holistically and not just single on this one instance with how many people were there in doing their jobs at the time. It's a larger a picture because it may also be unsafe to have like short uh, uh, short staffed situations for longer stretches of time it may be totally perfectly doable to do a shift with one or two people less than normal but maybe not every day yeah like well, now i don't know if it's the same in the us but at least in, in my hospital and most hospitals in spain what we've identified now is that uh, every COVID wave uh, implies a reduction on surgeries uh, that might need uh, ICU and certain procedures that might need ICU. And I think we're going to see in the near future how we are diagnosing and treating several diseases a bit later than. Yes, this. and, and I, I wish we could spend more time on this and this has just been such a robust discussion i really appreciate it and and laura it is true that it has caused for a reduction in scheduled surgery and that kind of thing but that also happened before covid with the flu uh, in at least in our community um so that is something that that uh we need to think about in terms of, of it's, it's, it's going to happen. I appreciated also that Kathy Eden said that the Joint Commission in the United States requires a discussion of staffing challenges during Sentinel events if it was a contributory factor. And, and so that is something that, that can be discussed. We would love to have more discussion on this. And I want you to know if your question wasn't answered that there will be a follow-up. We want you to also be reminded that we are offering continuing education for nurses, physicians, and pharmacists, and you'll receive an uh, automated evaluation from MedStar via email within the next five to seven days. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, this is what the email from MedStar will look like. Obviously, your name will be in the slot instead of uh, a black bar. And we are offering CE for healthcare executives, certified professionals in patient safety, board certified patient advocates, and certified professionals in healthcare quality. And we heard the person who said that they'd like to also see CE for physician's assistance, and we'll, we'll be looking into that. Thank you so much for joining us today, and please feel free to continue to send the Patient Safety Movement Foundation your comments and suggestions for future content. Thank you all. Have a great day.